OK, great. So uh, my name is David Steele. This is High Performance PG Backrest. I am the uh, principal architect at Crunchy Data. I've uh, been working with Postgres for now 20 years, which makes me feel a little bit old. Uh, I'm <laughs> primary author of PG Backrest, co-author of PG Audit, and also a Postgres contributor. So real quick, who knows what PG Backrest is? OK, that's pretty good. Let me, uh, let me just give you a quick overview. So, so this talk is really about performance. Um, so it's not an introductory talk, um, but that's fine. There's tons of introductory material on our website, in the user guide, et cetera, et cetera. So there's also older talks that I've done that are introductory talks. Um, uh, in this talk, we're gonna focus just on the performance aspects of PG Backrest. But we will give a quick overview of what is PG Backrest. So uh, PG Backrest aims to be a reliable backup and restore system but it can also scale up to the very largest database workloads. And, and to some extent, that's our niche, is um, you know, if you're measuring anything in tens or hundreds of terabytes, then you know, people are often using this software because our entire focus has been on performance from day one. And um, you know, the, the, I wrote the software when I was working with a 50 terabyte cluster. So you know, that'll give you an idea of the starting point <laughs> of what our initial requirements were. And we just kind of went from there. No, it's, um, it's extremely e uh, simple to configure. Uh, you know, for most systems, if you just uh, go to the user guide and go through the quick start, you're done. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff after the quick start, um, but really those, those like 10 paragraphs or so will get you up and running. It's packaged for the major operating system, so installing it's no problem, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we'll talk a little bit about configuration. Configuration is very easy, very flexible, um, but we're mostly gonna be talking about in relation to performance options and how you can tune specific commands. So the, the, we have a really strong emphasis on performance because of the you know, initial way the software started. Um, and so from the start, we, we uh, built parallel operation, asynchronous operation into everything, because uh, that's what we needed to keep our systems running. Um, we have like pretty all of the backup software, we have backup from standby. Um, as well, which may not, it's not exactly a performance option in terms of making the backup run faster, but it'll make your primary perform better um, because it takes the load off the primary and puts that onto one of your standbys. Um, and we have a really, really advanced configuration system. Uh, there are, are numerous ways to configure PG Backrest. Uh, you can tune each command exactly to the number of process max, et cetera. So that kind of tuning allows you to say, you know, have process max set one way for this command, a different way for this command. Uh, per cluster, you can do those settings, so you can really tune everything to exactly the way you want. Um, so PG Packers has a bunch of commands. Uh, I think we're uh, t about 20 right now. But there, there are four big ones. These are the core commands, OK? The first one is archive push. This is the one that allows you to uh, take a, a post, uh, allows Postgres, really, because it's the one initiating this command, to push a wall segment to the repository. Everyone know what wall is? Mostly? OK, so just, just really quickly, write-ahead log is the thing that allows your database to recover from a backup. So no backup is complete without at least some write-ahead log. Um, and this is the write-ahead log that we say you need to get to consistency. Um, and it's the write-ahead log that was generated during the backup. After that, there's more write-ahead log, and you can play that too if you want to get to some point in time. But the write-ahead log that was generated during the backup must be replayed. You know, it's not an option. You can't just say, oh, I want to stop in the middle of the backup. You can't do that. If you want to stop at a target in the middle of the backup, you're going to have to pick a previous backup and then play forward to that target. Um, but that area where you're uh, resolving your consistency, you can't mess with that. Um, the second thing is the backup, right? So archive push is an operation that's going on continuously all the time. Um, backups are periodic, so you're going to take maybe a full back one, up once a week. Uh, differential backup twice a week or once a day. Um, incremental backups at whatever interval you, know, you feel is appropriate. Uh, backup schedules are contentious topics, so I try not to get into it. But, but we support all three of the major backup types, and you basically are free to, to pick what you like. The next command is, so, so now we're on the other side. So uh, archive push and backup are both related to backup. This is getting your data into the repository in a safe fashion so that you can later retrieve it. Archive get is one of the tools that helps you do that. Um, and it allows Postgres to actually 
retrieve a completed wall segment from the repository. And, and then finally, there's restore. Um, now, everyone knows what Postgres recovery is. Uh, in Backrest, we make a very fine distinction between restore and recovery. So restore is what Backrest does. Restore is the initial operation of copying the files back to the um, system that Postgres needs to begin recovery. Uh, Backrest does not do recovery. That's Postgres's job. All we do is give it the data it needs to do recovery. So the initial part of that is copying back all the files to the system. The second part is setting up the archive get command. Um, you know, that's called restore command in Postgres, right? So restore underscore command, we call it archive get. Um, setting that up so that now Postgres has the initial state and then it can go retrieve whatever wall it needs to, to get you to consistency and eventually get you to a point in time if that's what you're interested in. So let's talk about features. Um, so in archive push, we not only have parallelism, but we have asynchronous operation. So that means that when you kick off an archive push command, it will optionally also start another process in the background asynchronously and then return from the archive push. So let's say you're pushing wall segment one. Um, it'll, it'll go in, it'll say, okay, well, uh, I, don't, I haven't pushed wall segment one yet. I need, I'll start this other process to start pushing segments. As soon as that foreground process sees that wall segment one is pushed, it will return to Postgres with success. The asynchronous process continues on, right? And it actually looks in the archive status directory for dot ready files and it can tell what, you know, because Postgres is running ahead of what we're doing. And so it's able to go, okay, well, I see there are 100 wall files that have already been completed. I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and push those up to the archive. Uh, because this interface, this, this archive command interface is a little bit creaky and a little bit slow. Did anyone go to my unconference session yesterday about, yeah. So that's exactly the type of thing that I'm trying to correct with the uh, archiver extension. But for now, Postgres wants to do this system call, you know, this external call for every single wall file that it wants to verify has been pushed. Uh, so we, we, we basically work in the background, we create these status files, so the foreground process does one of two things that either says, well, uh, it sees a status file that says, yeah, this thing has already been pushed to the archive, I can just return success. Or it doesn't see a status file and it starts up the async process and then waits for that okay file to, to show up. And yeah, so the, the status of each wall segment is stored locally. And, and these are kept around for a little bit. So if, uh, if Postgres crashes and starts or repushes something, it can be instantly notified that that was pushed. If for some reason the okay files have been expired, um, which will happen after Postgres uh, changes this dot ready to dot done, we can still go to the archive and verify that the thing you're pushing has already been pushed. Um, obviously that takes a little bit longer, so we keep those okay status files around as long as we can. Um, and this was the first part of PG Backrest, well, other than page checks on verification, uh, that was written in C. Um, especially that, that notification foreground process to go and look for those okay files. Uh, in Perl, our, our startup time was about, on, on server class systems, was about 300 milliseconds, um, which considering the size of the code base, even with conditional loading, was pretty impressive to be able to parse all that Perl, start it up, run, and do something functional in 300 milliseconds. But, but what that means is you really could only push three wall per second, um, which may not sound like a small number, but boy, it's a small number. Uh, when you're pushing you know, 50,000 per hour, um, yeah, that's a really small <laughs> number. So that was the first part we wrote in C. Now the entire archive push function is written in C to end to end. The async process, the notifier, all of it. So it is, it is as fast as it can be. And, and then on top of that, we have parallelism. So once the async process starts up, it will uh, uh, spawn any number of worker threads, whatever you tell it, and it'll go start doing work. This is especially important for this step, compression. Um, checksumming's not that expensive. Encryption, a little more expensive than checksumming, but boy, compression, that's the one that gets you. You know, when we're, when we're working on PG Backrest, we, obviously, we, we wanna make things optimal, we wanna make things fast, but there's really only one part of the program that's slow. It's right here. So in other places, we, 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 go, we skew very much towards correctness and safety and clarity because we know 99% of our stuff is here. It's actually 95 because these guys, checksumming can take a bit of time too. We checksum everything. And this isn't a talk about safety, but 
We checksum everything. Nothing is not checksummed. We also don't store, and this is a performance thing, but we don't store anything locally. So this all happens in stream through a filtering system that we wrote. So the files come off a disk, they go through the uh, filtering, and then they're pushed off to disk, to a remote server, to S3, you know, wherever it is your repo is sitting. They can be pushed off to a remote server and then to S3. You know, there's, there's a, a variety of ways you can configure it. So let's look at the configuration. Um, this is pretty simple. So this is a basic async configuration. By default, um, Backrest does synchronous archiving, and no configuration is required for that. So this is the idea of as small databases are easy to configure, right? Really, for a small database, all you really need is uh, point it at the database, and op optionally create, you know, change the archive, uh, the uh, sorry, the repo directory. Normally, you're going to do that because the default is var pg backrest, uh, sorry, var lib pg backrest, right? You don't really want to store stuff there. Probably, you want your backups to be somewhere else, offline, not on the database server. But you could mount NFS to var lib pg backrest, right? That would be valid. That's another way to do it. So our first, hmm, that's interesting. Our, uh, hmm, I think it got bored because I've been using the keyboard. Well, anyway, um, there we go. Uh, so the first thing we configure is archive async. This turns on the async process. You can do async with one process, and it will still be faster than doing, you know, than starting up PG backrest every single time. So if you don't want to use any more cores, but you just want to make things be a little more peppy, you know, reuse SSH connections, pipeline to S3, things like that, then you can turn on async and, and that's it. You will need a spool path, though. Um, PG backrest needs some place to store the notifications. They're not big, they're zero length files, so really it's just a directory. But we do need some place to store those and you will have to give us some place to store those. And last is process max. Uh, and sky's the limit here, but even on bigger systems, four is usually sufficient, right? If you're setting this to 16 or 32 or something like that, then you know, there's the chance to overwhelm your system uh, during peaks. Uh, if, if it's the most important thing in the world to offload this wall, you might think about doing that. But generally what happens, you have peaks, peaks and valleys of wall. You know, you're not generating a steady rate continuously, so it will catch up. But even four is enough to keep up with 30 to 50,000 wall per hour. So you don't really need much beyond that. Uh, right, so spool path is optional. That's where it defaults to. Most people don't put it there. <laughs> right, if you don't want to. I mean, I, I actually use this directory for my spool because like I said, it doesn't really store a lot of data. When we get to archive get, there's a copy out there. The behavior changed a little bit with archive get of what's best, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, this full directory must exist. And, and note that, so this is a snippet from our configuration file, pgbackrest.conf. But note that you can do everything with either environment variables. So if you're in a containerized environment, people like to use environment variables, right? That's very common. Um, you can also override anything on the command line. So all options basically can go on the command line. All options can go into the environment. Some options cannot go into the configuration file. For instance, one of the options you have to specify is which stanza we're dealing with. You can have multiple clusters configured. We call those stanzas. So you can't put the stanza, which stanza you're talking about in the configuration file, that makes absolutely no sense. But you can certainly put it in the environment, and you can certainly put it on the command line. So these two are everything the config file is 99.9% .9 of stuff, but some things don't make sense to put in the config file. So, right, so let's talk about backup. So backup, basically, our main performance features are uh, backup from standby. Um, and like I said, this isn't so much a feature of making the backup itself faster, although actually it can, because in, in many cases, your standbys can be a lot more idle, or you could just have a standby that's dedicated to doing backups. And you know, so you might have a standby that's reporting, a standby that's something, and a standby you're just going to use for backups. Um, and in which case, the backup probably will be faster because you're dedicating all the resources to that hardware. Also, what that means is you can set process max kind of as high as you want and not worry about clobbering your database server, which we don't want to do. Um, you'll give basically you can give it a list of database servers, so you can give it your entire 
you know, all of, your, all of your, your primary and all of your standbys in any order, and Backrest will go and figure it out. So it'll find the primary, uh, and, it'll, and it'll basically take the first live standby and do the backup. So the question is, why do we need the primary? Because <laughs> the standard backup from uh, standby methodology does not use a primary. The reason we do that is we actually create a primary style backup from, so it, it looks like a backup was taken from a primary. Uh, the other thing that's really nice, and we haven't actually implemented this yet because demand has been just starting to pick up for this idea, but this means we can do the backup across as many standbys as we want. So we can parallelize that backup across any amount of hardware that you would like. Uh, now the, yeah, sorry. You really need to do that by not putting them in the list. Um, that's, that's the way you do it. Uh, so if you're doing something with, um, you know, a lot of people configure uh, backrest with, um, you know, uh, configuration management type tools, uh, pick your, you know, whatever, chef, puppet, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm not really into that stuff. I'm not a sysadmin. But um, you can do that. Uh, backrest supports multiple configuration files, so you can have a config file per cluster, you know, there's all kinds of options. So you can actually have scripts that will go and, and change the list of, of backup, you know, servers that are active at that point for backup. And then, of course, you know, it's the same as um, archive push. It uses the same mechanisms for doing all of this. Uh, the same filtering scheme. Nothing is stored locally. Uh, everything is streamed to wherever wherever the repo is. So here's an example of a configuration. Um, we've got uh, backup. Oh, I want to point out that, and this was on the other slide too, global colon archive push. So what I'm doing here, you can put things in global. So let's say you have a, some settings that are universal, like you say you want to use buffer size of one meg instead of the default to four meg. You know, you want to be a little more uh, uh, memory conscious, or maybe you've got an embedded system, or who knows. So. You could put that in global, but this is a way that we can actually configure commands individually. So I'm only turning this on for backup. So that means in the, in the previous slide, you know that we had archive push process max set to four. Well, now we've got backup process max set to eight. So those will be independent. Archive push will run at four. Backup will run at eight. So you can individually, and if we wanted to, we could actually say demo colon backup and set specific backup settings for the demo stanza. So if you had a whole fleet of servers with a thousand stanzas, which I've seen, you can have, you know, the can have small process maxes, the big ones can have big process maxes, like other things like that. Um, and then here's our list of servers. Uh, the current primary can be in any position in this list. Doesn't matter. Um, you know, the understanding is that primaries will move around, <laughs> right? So reconfiguring when the primary moves is, you know, not great. Um, and then the first live standby found will be used to perform the backup. Um, at some point in the future, we will turn on our super uber, uh, use all the standbys for backups, and that will, but that will be an option that you'll need to turn on. Because um, people will already have things like this, and we don't want to suddenly change the behavior by, you know, hitting all their standbys uh, with backup. Even though each standby would be, you know, get less load uh, than the one standby that currently gets chosen. Question? <laughs> All right, well, if you remember it, let me know. All right, so the next one to talk about is archive get. Um, so now we're on the other side, right? So we've been talking about how to get our stuff safely and efficiently to the repository. Uh, that's step one. But really, in, in my other talk, I have a, um, uh, a little quote that I found somewhere on the uh, uh, internet. It's called Schrodinger's Backup, it's essentially uh, you know, the, the state of any backup is unknown until it's been restored, right? So, so this is the other half. Um, and, and this isn't a talk about backup correctness, but I really want to implore you, if you are taking backups, please do restores. Test your restores. And, and, and what I like to do here, I have something, kind of a concept I call living backups, and that is to, it, it's really painful and annoying and disruptive to have some kind of like fire drill to do your restores once a month. Some companies will do this and they'll say, you must do a restore to make sure that we know the procedures work. What I prefer to do is to have restores actually integrated into the enterprise. So maybe you're doing restores to a offline reporting server. 
Maybe you're doing restores into your pre-prod environment. Maybe you're doing restores into your, I mean, you pick it, right? But the idea is if, 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 that, if the restore mechanism is a regular thing that your company is doing, then when you get to the point where it's time to do a restore, people aren't going to be frightened. You know, it'll be a lower pressure situation because they're like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. I've done this before. This is, you know, no problem, right? So make your restores part of your workflow. Um, don't have uh, that, that emergency moment at 1 a.m. be the first time that you're going to do a restore. Not a great idea. So uh, archive get also works asynchronously and in parallel, um, just like archive push. But its mode of operation is different, right? We're not taking uh, requests from Postgres well, we are, right? So we're gonna, Postgres is gonna tell us like, hey, I need this wall segment. And, and we can bet, right, we're fairly certain that if it asks for wall segment one, pretty soon it's gonna be asking for wall segment two, right? And if we don't have that in hand, we're gonna have to tell Postgres, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me go get that and I'll be back. So what we do instead is we build a queue of the wall segments that Postgres is going to need. Um, and you can set the size of this queue and stuff like that. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and then we, we build up that queue in the background, and Postgres will be requesting things in the foreground, and we can just hand it the wall segment and say, here, 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 here. This is where the, um, the uh, spool directory starts to matter. So before I told you it didn't really matter where the spool directory was, right? It could just be in varlib pg backrest, whatever, or var spool pg backrest, rather. Um, but now it kind of matters, because if the spool directory is on the same device as the Postgres uh, PG wall directory, then we can do a move from one directory to the other. You know, and we don't have to do a full copy. So we've already, in the asynchronous mode, we've already done a copy, right? Because we've copied it to the spool directory. Um, so we've already paid that price. And we've synced it as well, right? Because we want to make sure that that file is really, really, really there. Now, if they're in the same, uh, on the same device, we can actually move it instead. And the nice thing there is you don't have to sync that. Um, you don't really care because if the system crashes, then Postgres is going to start up and it's going to re-request that wall file. It's never going to reuse a wall file that it request on a previous recovery. So you know that it's going to come right back to you and say, hey, give me that wall file again, would you? And you give it again. So, so for performance reasons, it's really, really good that it's, if it's on the same device. I say PGX log PG wall here because I know there are people who are still running below Postgres 10. Um, in fact, I had two Postgres 9.4 clusters that are mine. I just upgraded one to 11. The other one's still on 9.4. But I am going to do it before EOL, I promise. So, <laughs> you know, when people tell me they're running older versions of Postgres, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I do the same thing. And then archive get, uh, this is also, this is the second thing we wrote in C, uh, the notification process for archive get. And now archive get is end to end written in C as well. Um, and again, uh, it uses the same mechanism. All the, all the file copies, all the file transfers work, work exactly the same way in PG Backrest. Um, this is all code we wrote. Yeah, Nick, what's up? OK, well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, because the PG Backrest F-Sync mechanism is, is the simple as possible. So you're probably referring to the problems that, PG, uh, that Postgres has had with F-Sync, are you? So the, the Postgres is, is like, let's say you sort of crash yeah. the recovery. Now Postgres is uh, requesting the file from F, right? Yeah. So it tells PG Backrest, like, give me this file. But will PG Backrest go and check it again from the email storage if it has already hit that and F-Sync it? It won't. It won't. Okay, so the way it knows is the, this is the standard POSIX technique, because spool directories are always POSIX directories. You know, they're always on a POSIX compliant file system. And so we do the standard technique of copy it to a temp file, sync it, remove it, sync the directory. Right, so in that case, the worst thing that can happen is the file can disappear. Right, because you sync the file, then you rename it, but now you've got to sync the directory. If something goes wrong with that directory sync, then that file will disappear. You know, the rename will, will not happen. And in that case, what you'll do is you'll go fetch it again, in that case. But if the, if the file exists with the correct name, then, you know, this is the same way that Postgres does durable renames. We're confident that's correct. But, trust but verify, right? So, like I said before, PG Backrest checksums everything. Everything. So, 
Um, and so does Postgres, in this case at least. So if we're dealing with things we've copied over to the repo, we're gonna recheck some of that when we copy it back. You know, we never trust the thing off in the repo. All kinds of things happen to repositories, right? So when we're doing an archive get to get that file back, we re-verify the SHA-1 checksum against the original checksum. If it fails, you've got a problem. Um, additionally, uh, wall segments, Postgres can tell if they're corrupt because they have internal checksums. So you'll also get a uh, error from Postgres. So if somehow, because the one thing we're not protecting against here is PG Backrest syncs the file, someone comes along and corrupts it, and then we hand it to Postgres. Now normally what our, our, our answer there would be to recheck sum it, because we like checksumming things, but in this case we know that Postgres is gonna detect that corruption on its own. So we're just gonna let that one go. Because it's gonna do the checksumming no matter what we do. So rather than recheck summing something that's been at rest, we'll let Postgres error on that instead. No, no, this, this is always true, always true. This is, these are the built-in checksums in the wall. The nice thing about the wall is the wall changes with every release of Postgres. So basically, we can make any change to the wall we want at all. Not, I mean, there's no, there's, there's no limitation essentially to what we can do to the wall. Whereas the, um, the heap files, you know, if you do a PG upgrade, essentially we're just copying those files. Their on disk format has to remain the same, but the wall can change as much as it wants. Walls had checksums for quite a long time. I don't know how long, maybe Andre knows, but it's the page checksums that are things you have to turn on. Uh, the, the wall checksums are always in place. See where I am, okay. So, right, so here's the configuration, example configuration. Um, so, as far as process max goes, archive get generally requires a lot fewer processes than archive push does. Um, decompression is, by its very nature, faster than compression. Um, so generally, you don't have to, to jack this up as much. On the other hand, <laughs> having said that, uh, it, it doesn't hurt much to have those extra processes available. And uh, unless you're running Postgres servers, you know, running a, a number of clusters on the same host, when you're doing a recovery, which archive get is really just gonna be running generally during recovery, there are some other scenarios like replicas, keeping replicas up to date. So the replica might be serving reporting quests and pulling from the archive at the same time. But in general, when you really care about this, um, your cluster is going to be shut down. Uh, so the idea is use all the CPU, res you, CPU resources you can. Now don't set this to something like 96. That'd be silly. I mean, I'm having a hard time imagining anything greater than eight here would be necessary. And that would only be true, in my opinion, if you had really high latency storage. You know, because then the processes can run in parallel and, and work with a high latency storage. Um, I consider, for instance, S3 to be high latency storage. Uh, you know, if you're comparing it to a locally mounted volume, right, or something like that. And it's not bad, and, and we implement pipe, we have pipelining and all that good stuff, so S3 is pretty fast under those circumstances, but it's not as fast as a local disk. You know, that's for sure, it's just the way it is. If you have even higher latency storage, like some kind of remote DR, NFS, cluster, who knows, thing, then process max can be your friend in that case. And the idea here is to keep Postgres supplied with wall so it doesn't have to wait. The Postgres recovery is a single threaded process. And so really it doesn't take much to keep it supplied with wall. Um, one of the things that we are looking at doing is, um, did anyone go to Sean's uh, pre-falter talk last year? Is that the same conference? Um, so anyway, the idea is that you can scan through the wall and actually load those blocks into memory, you know, the blocks that are, that are gonna be touched uh, into memory before, um, uh, before Postgres starts reading those wall segments, which Andre's already done in WallG, by the way, which is pretty cool. So now I'm a little jealous. But, uh, <laughs> um, but we're, gonna be, we're gonna be doing that soon. But basically, the, the problem is Postgres recovery is just not fast. So keeping ahead of it is easy. Whereas on the archive push side, it actually can be a bit of a challenge to keep ahead of Postgres, because Postgres can generate wall like gangbusters, because that's happening in a multi-process way. So if, you, if your system is fast enough, you can be generating, like I said, I've seen you know, up to 30,000 an hour or more, right? So, but recovering is a different story. It's single-threaded, uh, you know, it's got inherent bottlenecks. So, so we don't really have a whole lot of trouble staying ahead of it, but Using the asynchronous operation allows you to, so let's say you're um, going over the SSH protocol to get to a remote repo server or something. You don't have to start up an SSH connection every time 
uh, that you get a wall segment. Same thing is true for S3. Since we have pipelining, you don't have to negotiate a new TLS connection every time you're going to ask for something. If you're pulling down 64 wall files, they're just going to come through bang, 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 bang. So even though Postgres is slow, and this was the last function we made async and parallel. And the reason was is that with some configuration like Control Master and some other stuff, you could generally keep ahead of Postgres without any real significant problems, so we didn't worry about it too much. Um, but especially with the addition of the S3 storage driver, um, you know, the additional latency that was uh, um, added there totally made this worth it. All right, so this is really important. Restore performance is more important than backup performance, right? So I, I get a lot of people who are really stressed out about how fast they're, they want to get their backups to run as fast as possible. So I ask them how long their backups are taking to run, they'll be like, oh, there's, there's six hours, our full backups are six hours. I'm like, well, that's great. I said, slow it down. Use, use, you know, reduce process max. What's your process max? And they'll say, well, process max is four or eight or, you know, whatever. I'm like, cut that in half. You know, if your full backups are running in 12 hours or less, you're golden. You know, why worry? And the last thing you want to do is put load on systems that you don't have to do or load on your network that you don't have to do. So essentially, you're using resources that don't matter because every backup, as long as you're archiving, your old backup is consistent, right? So if for some reason you had a full backup that was running six hours, uh, something happened, you needed to get back to a point in time that was exactly three hours into that backup, well, you'd use your previous backup to do that. You know, as long as you've got backups in your repo, you've got backups. Now, if you're not archiving, that's a big deal. Uh, and, and when we're dealing with customers in the field, you know, people get upset if a backup doesn't run. I'm like, don't worry about the backups. As long as you're getting regular, regular backups, you're good. If you're not archiving, then that's a 1 a.m. kind of emergency. Uh, if you're not backing up, that's an 8 a.m. on Monday kind of emergency, right? That's not a weekend emergency. It doesn't matter as long as you're archiving. If you're not archiving, you've got problems. You know, you're not safe at that point. So one of the things we do to uh, make restore faster is, remember I said originally, we, we check some everything. So in the, every backup has uh, what we call manifest, and it has a list of all the files that make up the backup their checksums, their sizes, their original timestamps, like all of it, uh, you know, file mode, user group, you name it. Um, part of that is so we can create, you know, when we restore the backup, it looks exactly like the cluster looked like at that moment, timestamps and everything. But also, we can use those checksums that were generated to do what we call a, a delta. And so instead of going and fetching everything from the backup, which can be expensive in terms of time, uh, in S3, it can be expensive in terms of money, right? So now we're not just talking about time anymore and maybe resources. We're talking about actual cash that you're going to have to spend to get your data back from S3. So instead, what we can do is go and check some all the files in the local directory. So if there's any file in the local directory that doesn't exist in the uh, manifest, we kill it. It just gets deleted, right? Um, if there's a, a file that exists, we check some at first using the original SHA-1 checks, you know, and compare it against the SHA-1 checksum that we originally stored. And so then we can say, well, if this is the same file, there's nothing to do, and we move on. If the file doesn't exist or if the checksum does not match, then you need to pull it from a storage. And I frequently get people who are, who are, who are just like, you know, because they're just doing test stuff, really. They're not doing much. They'll say, well, I'll do a restore, and then I'll play around with a couple things, and I'll do another restore, and the restore takes two seconds. And they can't understand how it's a two-second restore. And I'm like, we well, didn't really change anything. You know, it's like it's very, very fast if you don't change stuff. Two seconds is an exaggeration, minute, you know, whatever. Because you still have to check some of the files. You know, we don't trust. <laughs> we verify, right? So even if the timestamps haven't changed, even if the cluster looks pretty idle, we're going to go th sweep through, check all those checksums again, and make sure that nothing has actually changed. And yeah, so that means we only transfer the files that have changed since the last backup. Now, to say that if you're using PG Backrest, this is not the default mode. The default mode is that it expects an empty directory, and if the directory is not empty, it's going to give you an error. But it will then suggest, like, hey, did you mean, you know, you could run dash dash delta. That might be a cool option for you. So, um, oops. So, yeah, you definitely want to turn on delta. Uh, very important. And then, I don't know, I just put this on every slide. But you know, I don't really have much to talk about after the first time, so maybe I should kill it. But I just want to make it clear that, again, 
all of this is running in parallel to the degree that you specify. Uh, so restore uh, process max equals 16 in this case. So we had archive push at 4, archive get at 2, backup at 8, and restore at 16. Um, and so the, these are, you know, like relatively good ratios, right? So uh, not the exact numbers, but say maybe, you know, restore should generally be about twice backup or even three times backup. Uh, archive get should be half of archive push, whatever those numbers happen to be. All right, it's just a, just a general benchmark. And then we're going to turn on delta all the time. Delta does some additional checks to, you may get some weird errors because if, if you're Postgres, Delta wants to check to see that you're really restoring to a Postgres cluster. So it's going to expect to see certain things. It wants to see a PG version file in the root. Um, if it doesn't see a PG version file, it wants to see the uh, file that Backrest drops in when it's doing a restore. You know, it has its own status file that drops in there when it's in the restore. Because um, if the PG version file is somehow changed, like let's say we're doing a delta against a, to a previous version of Postgres. You know, we went to 9.5, we didn't like 9.5. Now we're going to restore back to 9.4. Well, the PG version file is, is going to get deleted because it doesn't, it's, it's different, right? It will fail its checksum and it's going to get deleted. So we have our own status file we put in. If neither of those files are fine, you're going to you're gonna get an error. And it's going to force you to go clean the directory out. Because we don't want you, say, pointing at root and say, well, I'll just, I'm just going to restore root, and then whoosh. You can run PG backrest as root, um, and this is useful if you want to you know, get the permission set a certain way that a user wouldn't be able to do or whatever. I don't recommend it, just like anything else. Don't run as root. Never run as root, but, but you can. And even, well, think about this. Even if you're running as Postgres, let's think about varlib PostgreSQL, right? You could have, or varlib PG SQL. You could have all these clusters in there, right, that are just going to get completely wiped out if you point at the wrong place. So if you get those weird errors, it'll tell you, it'll say, hey, I can't, I, this doesn't look like a Postgres directory to me. I can't do this. You know, you're, you're going to have to go and manually uh, do the wipe yourself. This is exceedingly rare. I've never actually gotten an issue for this. Um, you really have to have some kind of weird failure scenario in the middle of the restore to get in that situation. We do try to prevent it. But there is a race condition between when our status file is written, when PG version is deleted, you know, like that kind of stuff. It's, so it's possible. It can happen. Um, so I, I talked about this a little bit before, but I want to mention it again, that process max is not just good for, uh, you know, getting more cores going. Um, if you have high latency storage, you can use this to over, overcome some of that latency. Because um, you're still going to be waiting, but you're going to have eight processes doing it instead of four or two. And this is the kind of the exception to what I talked about before where um, you, know, you want to keep archive push and archive get kind of low. Uh, if you have the situation where you have very high latency storage and you're not getting the throughput that you want, then this is one way to solve that. Uh, in the case of S3, pipelining should mostly deal with this situation. Um, but you're still going to have latency for the new requests. You know, there's no TLS connection, but you still have to push a request up um, I have seen, uh, I, I had a user report a couple of years ago that they were seeing uh, eight seconds of latency from where they were in, in Eastern Europe to S3 to get their stuff out. It was just a, like a four meg file. So a 16 meg file compressed to four meg. And it was taking about eight seconds. And I said, okay, well, that's a long time. But try it with um, the AWS CLI and see what the timings are. Um, and from the CLI, it was actually nine seconds. So backrest was consistently beating the CLI. But, you know, it is what it is, right? I can't help that kind of latency to some extent. We do everything we can. In S3. Well, you mean the database was in AWS and the repo was in S3? Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. So, so if, yeah, yeah. So if you're in, yeah, if you're in the Amazon network, your S3 performance is going to be significantly better, right? That's just the way it goes. And it's not, you know, Amazon may be gaming that to some extent, but the fact is you're on their network on whoever, who knows what kind of switches, right? I mean, so it's just going to be faster. So if you want the best performance, run in AWS. But I know tons and tons of people, including myself, who don't run in AWS 
but use S3 for backup storage and the performance is perfectly acceptable. You know, if you're here in the United States and you're on, you know, you've got a hosted server someplace, you're just, it's not gonna be a problem. But having said that, it's slower than running locally. So we are working on multi-repo support. So you can have a near line repo with a couple of backups and, and then longer term storage out in S3. Um, and Backrest will, whatever recovery point you need to get to, it'll automatically select a repo and go get the backup from there. Um, because a restoring locally is still a lot faster. And if absolute, you know, getting that data back incredibly quickly is your priority, then, then that's what you do. Um, compression. So there are some ways you can get some economy with by changing compression settings. For instance, you can set the compress level down to three, um, and that will give you quite a bit better performance for not that much loss, about 20% loss generally in compression ratio. So if speed is more important to you than, uh, you know, network I/O and storage then you can do that. Um, we are also introducing LZ4 support this summer. Um, at long last, we have enough of the code in C now that we can actually add a new feature, yay. <laughs> and, um, and so, the, oop. and this is a faster alternative to gzip. Now, it'll give you, the compression ratios are, are similar to a gzip level three, um, sometimes worse, sometimes a little better, but it's like five times faster. So yeah, it's, it's really, really worth it. LZ4 is fantastic. Um, so if really, if, if, if just, if compression, I mean, imagine you're on a server where you've got a pretty good network, but you only got eight cores. You know, it's a relatively small server, you got more data maybe, or you're gonna upgrade, but you just haven't yet. This would be a good alternative. You're trading space for CPU. GZIP level three does that to a large extent too, but it's not as fast as this. So the future. Um, so the entire project will be migrated to C by the end of this year. Uh, we've made a ton of progress, we're on our way. Um, the initial reason for the migration was primarily performance of the archive commands. Because as I said earlier, the startup cost of Perl was high, 300 milliseconds to start up the Perl process. It was agonizing. But once we started, we kept going. Um, polyglot projects aren't a lot of fun. Uh, C is faster than in other areas. We've been able to make a lot of performance enhancements that we've gone. Not because C is necessarily better than Perl in that way, but because anytime you rewrite something, you could do it better. Uh, the other nice thing is this gives us very, very easy access to all the internal data structures of Postgres. So for instance, reading PG control, reading wall files, reading all that, it becomes trivially simple because we, we have an interface layer where we literally per version just copy stuff from Postgres and say from Postgres 8.3 to 9.1, this function looked this way, boom. And it's just in there, it's a copy paste operation. And then we have access to all of Postgres internals to do all the cool stuff that we want to do in the future. That's what I've got, any questions? It's up to you. Yeah. I mean, we're just doing a, 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 a standard look up here. So, I mean, you can, you, it can really be anything. Um, you can't just put port numbers on, well, you, you can put port numbers on there because the Perl code will just kind of accept it. <laughs> and I had to backpatch that into the C code because I didn't realize the Perl code was just taking port numbers appended to host names, like automatically. I'm like, yay. And we migrated that stuff to the C code, it broke some things for people who were doing that. So we have a separate column for port, and this has to do with, say, IPv6 addresses. You can't put a colon at the end, which is the convention for denoting port, because IPv6 has colons in it. So what we're gonna do is probably keep the feature where you can use colons where they're appropriate and simple, but if you need to, you can always go use the port option as well. But basically, IP, host, you know, uh, A record, C name, anything that can be resolved on your computer, it can be an Etsy host you know, Etsy, uh, hosts, uh, you name it, all kinds of uh, stuff. Anything else? Oh, sorry, I thought I, I thought I saw you put your hand up. <laughs> 